All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, it's about eight after, so. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out. It's not so cold, not so slick. Hopefully, you've made it safely. Actually, I just fell in the parking lot. Oh, <laughs> it is slippery. Yeah. I noticed that. Oh, no. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. So, it is it slick like out black there. Ice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I caught myself before I did. So. Oh. oh, man. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. It's okay. Well, it's good we're talking about the healing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's appropriate. Uh, let's recap just a little bit about um, the first two parts that we covered the last two weeks with Elijah's trigger and journey. You know, after that huge victory on Mount Carmel, he uh, goes to Jezreel and then just gets super discouraged that his expectations of a complete revival and maybe even a replacement of the wicked king Ahab and Jezebel did not happen. He <clears throat> went into a deep depression, even suicidal. <clears throat> and then as he explores trying to get back with God, his journey of 40 days to Mount Sinai, you know, over 250 miles, his, his narrative changes from just being discouraged, I've had enough, I'm no better than my ancestors, to, you know, I've done a pretty good job, and these Israelites are the ones that are messing everything up, and uh, blaming other people, and being critical, and then when he finally gets to the cave, God shows him his power with earthquakes, and fires, and, and yet Elijah really wasn't willing to go much deeper in his vulnerability. He really wasn't willing to, at that point, uh, be more vulnerable. So we pick it up here in uh, 1 Kings 19, in verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came, go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphath, from abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazel, Hazel and Elisha. Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So the Lord gave him very specific directions on what to do. It was going to change even his ministry because Elijah is going to replace you as my prophet. And <clears throat> part of the uh, lesson, the takeaway from a lot of what God did with Elijah here, where he corrected his thinking. Elijah said, I'm the only prophet left and uh, the Israelites are trying to kill me, and God here tells him, no, you know, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed down to these idols. And, you know, that happens when we get in a bad place emotionally. You know, our perspective and spiritual view of things is distorted, and we don't see things real clearly. And it was the same with Elijah. And the encouraging part of this whole story, and what we're going to get into today is, God healed Elijah. He brought him out of that despair, that emotional funk he was in. And that's encouraging to us because the Bible says in James that Elijah was a man just like us. So God can heal us too. If we'll take to heart the lessons that we can glean from this healing of how God handled Elijah. Let's look at uh, let's look at a map here. You know, God gave him very specific direction in a specific order. <clears throat> God tells him to go back the way you came. <clears throat> well, let's um, let's look here. Here's Mount Carmel. Okay, that's where he had that huge victory on the mountain, the big showdown with the Baal prophets who lost in a big way. And he journeyed from there 17 miles down to Jezreel, and that's where he got triggered. <clears throat> and from there he went down south to Mount Sinai, which is a good 250 miles uh, or even longer uh, from, from there, where he met God in the cave. <clears throat> it's about 350 miles from Jezreel. 
And that's where God gave him the direction. Well, he said the first thing to do is travel to the wilderness of Damascus. So he's got to travel 350 miles north up into this area of, of the world. And God says, go to Damascus and anoint Hazio, the king of Aram. Here's where Damascus is, up here in the upper right-hand corner. Way up there. Elijah, that's the first thing you're supposed to do. Go way up there. Second thing, anoint Jehu, king over Israel. Lower right-hand corner, that's where Jehu's at. That's the second thing you're supposed to do. Then you're supposed to anoint Elisha to replace you as my prophet. Well, here's his hometown. That's where Elisha's at. Right next to it, that's where <coughs> Elisha's hometown is. So what's the first thing Elijah does? He anoints Elisha. Well, if you're trying to save gas, <laughs> that's the best thing to do, right? That's the first thing. That's, he's the closest. I'm just going to get this done. Why do you think Elijah didn't follow God's direction? He didn't anoint the other two. He went right to Elisha. Anybody have any thoughts? We don't know the reason, so there's no right answer or wrong answer. Makes you wonder if he's <clears throat> looking to get out of this position sooner than later. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. I just wonder if he was overwhelmed, you know? Like. <laughs> well, you know, when you're in that place and you're not uh, emotionally very strong, you see things more in a negative light, it's like, you know, he had said earlier, Lord, I'm done. God's given him a way out. Okay, I'm taking it. I don't, who knows? But it's just an observation. But he didn't do that. Then when Elijah anoints Elisha, he tells him, see if we can find that. Yeah, verse 20. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? You know, that can give you one impression, almost <coughs> like he's regretting. Like, oh, now, now I've pulled you into it. But <clears throat> one translation, the Latin Vulgate, um, appears to provide the correct meaning of this passage through the placement and the order of the Hebrew words. The translation in the Latin Vulgate, instead of saying, go back, <clears throat> what have I done to you? It says... Go and return back, for that which was my part I have done to thee. That gives you, that, that's a little different spin, right? It's like, okay, I've, I've done my part. You, you go do whatever you need to. I've done my part here. So some of you have already mentioned this, but how would you describe a, Elijah, Elijah's emotional state right now? He didn't do the other two anointments. He just did Elisha. Where do you think he's at emotionally? Some Dis of you mentioned maybe overwhelmed. I don't know if that's an emotion, but <laughs> it's negative. Disconnected. Disconnected. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, you know, between this moment and Second Kings two verse eleven, when he's taken up in a whirlwind. There's a period of time where God heals Elijah. He gets his fire back. And we're going to let's look at that so that we can learn how that can help us heal and help those that we're trying to help also heal. All right, what I'm going to show you is a timeline of what's happening over a period of time from this moment when he anointed Elisha. And it's based on these chapters, 1 Kings 20 to 22 and 2 Kings 1 to 2. And we'll start off this timeline <clears throat> right where we left off. Elijah anoints Elisha. 
And Elisha, he was out Mount Sinai, and then he went north and uh, anointed Elisha. <clears throat> when First Kings chapter 20, in verse 1, it says, Now Benadad, king of Aram, mustered his entire army. So there's a big attack between Aram and Israel. Remember the king of Israel right now is Ahab. He's a wicked, evil king. When you go, and we're not going to read the whole chapter here. You go down to verse 21. It said, The king of Israel advanced and overpowered the horses and chariots and inflicted heavy losses on the Arameans. So there's a great victory there. And then in verse 26, it says, The next spring, Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. So, so there's a second battle going on. So Ahab, as wicked as he is, God allowed him to have two victories in these battles against uh, the king of Aram. And it said that <clears throat> the second one happened in the next spring. So that's, that's at least a year later. In chapter 22, in verse 1, it says, For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. So now you've got, <clears throat> after these two huge victories, there's no more battle. And at the end of that chapter, Ahab dies. But they didn't have any war for three years. So that's at least another three years where there wasn't any war. And then in 2 Kings chapter 1, it says Ahab's son dies. <clears throat> but in chapter 22, verse 37, I think that was the one I skipped over. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried him there. That's King Ahab. So Ahab dies. Verse 40, Ahab rested with his fathers, and Ahaziah, his son, succeeded him as king. So King Ahab dies, his son Ahaziah is king. And in verse 51, Ahaziah, son of Ahab, became king of Israel and Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years. And then it talks about him dying in 2 Kings chapter 1. So Ahab's son, Ahaziah, dies. And the Bible says that he reigned for two years. So you've got another two-year period here. After Ahab died, his son takes over. Two years later, he dies. <clears throat> and this is when, in chapter 2, 2 Kings, that's when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind. So you've got a six-year period here where God's working with Elijah. And we don't have... There's not a lot of insight into God's interaction with Elijah except for two incidences that we're going to talk about <clears throat> and try to, to fill you in a little bit here. As far as the other two appointments uh, that God directed Elijah to do that he didn't do, well, Elisha ended up doing it. In 2 Kings 8, <clears throat> we talk. it talks about he actually goes to Haziel and anoints him Aram's new king. And the Bible says that that happened sometime later. And then uh, Elisha sends a prophet to Jehu in 2 Kings 9 and anoints. So Elisha didn't anoint him, but he sent a prophet to anoint Jehu, Israel's new king. So he replaced um, Ahab's second son. So after Ahaziah died, after that two-year period, Ahab had another son called Joram, and Joram became king in 2 Kings 8, verse 16. And he was the one Jehu replaced. So hopefully this isn't too confusing, but what happened was when Haziel became king of Aram, 
and Jehu became king of Israel. Jehu killed all of Ahab's family, relatives, and descendants in Jezreel. He also destroyed all the prophets of Baal and any Baal worshiper in Samaria. So let's go back to Elijah for a second. During this six-year period, what was going on with Elijah? Well, we're going to learn here in, in a little bit that there seemed to be two groups of prophets in Bethel and Jericho. And it seemed that Elijah spent most of his time with those prophets. But there were two moments here in the scriptures. One of them, God told Elijah to go back and confront Ahab when he took Naboth's vineyard. You remember that story? Mm -hmm. He wanted the vineyard. Naboth said, no, nah, I'm not selling. Ahab gets angry. <laughs> and he actually gets depressed and mopes around. And then his wife takes over and says, I'll get the vineyard for her. Has Naboth killed? And God sends Elijah back. Well, at that time, where was Naboth's vineyard? 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings 21. In verse 1. Sometime later, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel, close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Naboth's vineyard is in Jezreel. Who else is in Jezreel? King Ahab. Where's Jezebel? She's in Jezreel too. Wasn't she the one who threatened Elijah? That triggered his emotions? That got him all discouraged and God sent him back. So one of the things that God did with Elijah, he made him face his fears. Remember, he got, he got so scared that Jezebel, he was going to be her ne next death row victim. He loses his heart, his commitment. His, he, he, he just, I'm no better than my ancestors. She's going to succeed. I have failed. All those negative emotions, and God brings him to a place. Now, it happens sometime between one year later and three years later. We don't know when. But he, God's been working with him for at least a year. And he sends him back. Hmm. When you read the story, when he goes back, he doesn't hesitate. Mm -hmm. He doesn't complain to God about, <clears throat> well, she's going to kill me. And he doesn't have a lot of those fears. Those fears have been replaced mm -hmm. with confidence. I'm going to obey. And that's, that's the spirit you saw in Elijah before he got triggered, before he got emotional and discouraged. He was on fire, faithful, obedient, trusting. And for him to be able to go back and face her face to face, well, that's got to be a transformation. Something happened there within Elijah. So that's one of the things that you have to do if you're going to come out of these kind of funks. <coughs> You're going to have to face your fears. You're going to have to have the courage to deal with them. And God brought Elijah to that place. Let's look in verse 20 of this <coughs> chapter, 1 Kings 21. Because it's, there's an interesting um, interaction here when Elijah confronts him. Ahab said to Elijah in verse 20, So you have found me, my enemy. I have found you, he answered, because you've sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. 
I am going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I'll make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Bashah, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. And also concerning Jezebel, the Lord says dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Or you don't sense any hesitation here, do you? <laughs> he doesn't have those. He sees Jezebel in the right light. Verse 24, dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. And look at what happens. When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. You know, that's an amazing statement of God's mercy. As wicked as he was, he had this moment of clarity and he humbled himself and God noticed you know, and that's encouraging for us. When Sometimes when we come out of these emotional funks, we have to deal with some things that have been in our hearts for a while. Maybe we have been blaming. Sometimes we just get selfish or whatever it is that has caused us not to get out of it. When we do see some of those things and respond, God notices. And that's encouraging. Even a, a wicked king as Ahab, none of us have done those kind of things that he led a whole nation down the wrong path. And God decided, you know what? Yeah, I'm still going to bring these things on his descendants, but I'm not going to do it during his lifetime. You know, and it could be, this is <laughs> speculation on my part, but it could be that those other two anointments that he told Elijah to do, you know, anoint Hazael, king, the new king of Aram, anoint Jehu, the new king of Israel, God may have had a change of heart and decided, let's delay that. Hmm. So to me, it puts a, you know, at first you could think, okay, Elijah, you didn't obey God. You didn't anoint these people. But maybe God changed his mind right here. Hmm and told Elijah, it's okay. You anointed Elisha, we're going to wait on the other two things. Now again, that's, that's pure speculation on my part. <clears throat> Let's look at the second incident <clears throat> where Elijah confronts <clears throat> his son, Ahab's son, Ahaziah. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter one. Ahaziah's king, right? And this is where um, Second Kings chapter one. We won't read the the whole chapter here, but this is when Ahaziah has um, gotten sick, and he wanted somebody to go talk to Elijah. Because somebody said in verse um, 3, The angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbi, Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it, is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going off to consult Baal Zebub, the god of Ekram? Therefore, this is what the Lord says, You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So Elijah went. 
And the messengers came back. He, the king asked him, why have you come back? A man came to meet us. And he told him what he said. And then the king, Ahaziah, remember he sends a group of 50 army guys with a captain to go pick up Elijah and bring him back. Well, and fire came down from heaven, destroyed him. He sends another 50 with another captain. Fire comes down again. He sends the <coughs> third group, and that captain's a lot more humble. And the angel tells Elijah, you can go with that. You can go with that guy. And I want you, I've got a picture there, because it simply says in, the, in that story that Elijah's sitting on a mountain. And this captain comes and arrogantly says, come down, we're going to arrest you. And Elijah calls fire down from God to destroy him. Elijah got his fire back. Mm. Remember the, uh, the Mount Carmel incident? Fire came down, destroyed the altar. Same thing's happening again. But Elijah's a different guy. Mm. He's, he's not wigging out. He's not, you know, having a, an emotional meltdown. He's, <coughs> he's confident. He's sitting there. He's trusting. Mm. Because <clears throat> in verse 13 of this chapter, 2 Kings 1, So the king sent a third captain with his 50 men. This third captain went up and fell on his knees before Elijah. Man of God, he begged, please have respect for my life and the lives of these 50 men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. You know, the first two, came, the first two captains that came, Elijah sits on the mountain, and he's so in touch with God leading his life. He's listening to the angel. He knows this is not the captain. And by the time the third one comes, the angel says, Go on down, don't be afraid. Trust. Mm. <clears throat> you see a completely different Elijah, mm. right? These six years, not only did he go back and deal with his fears with Jezebel, but no longer is he afraid that somebody's going to kill him. Mm -hmm. He's sitting on the mountain just so trusting, so in touch with God, where do you want me to go? He, he's just relying, there's a closeness there. This transformation that God did was really incredible. And it's very, very encouraging <coughs> to us. Then he's taken up in a whirlwind. Well, let's look at how, maybe how God did that. <clears throat> You know, this we're going to read here, 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Because I think this gives us a little bit of insight of what, what may have been happening during these six years. Verse 1, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, but do not speak of it. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. <coughs> and he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elijah and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, but <clears throat> do not speak of it. And Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them 
walked on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his coat, cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell him, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing. And Elisha said, Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. And as they walked along and talked in together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared, separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. So there's a group of prophets here at Bethel, and there's a group of prophets at Jericho. And it just seems, you just get the impression that from the moment he left, when he anointed Elisha, they just hung out in this area with these prophets. Prophet in Bethel, group of them in Jericho, maybe there's a group of them in Gilgal too. You can see where that area is compared to Jezreel. You know, it's at least 75 miles south. So he's, he's three or four days away from Jezebel. God's taken him away. God's changed his ministry. Okay, remember back Elijah was, he was doing this ministry thing all by himself. I've got this vision. I'm going to go out. We're going to have a famine, and then we're going to have this big showdown on Mount Carmel, and all this stuff. And then when things didn't go exactly the way he wanted, he got so discouraged. And God says, you know what? Your ministry now is going to be different. And he puts him in a group of people that are spiritually minded, prophets, focused on God, They've almost separated themselves from the corruption that was going on in Israel. And in that environment, and oh, by the way, we're going to have Elisha right next to you learning. He's going to be your buddy. You're not going to be doing this alone anymore. In this environment, Elisha thrived. And his whole demeanor his trust came back, his obedience came back, his faith. God completely restored him with this kind of environment. And you remember back, uh, we talked about personality types that we said, you know, Elijah is an ENFJ. And you know how they are. They're very <coughs> creative. They've got vision. They're passionate. They want to do good. They, they throw themselves completely into the task, but they can also have, they, they throw themselves too much in the task, they don't take care of themselves, they can be too sensitive, they can be easily discouraged. So I looked up, how do you support ENFJs? How do you help an ENFJ? And uh, this, is, this is what I got from, from the internet. And just as, as I read this, compare to what God did with him. ENFJs often feel extremely guilty when they experience feelings of depression. It is difficult for the ENFJ to take the time to tend to their own emotions, which can actually lead to these depressive feelings. They will often experience worsened feelings of depression if they do not feel the support of their loved ones. ENFJs are always there for the people closest to them, which makes it hard for them to carry on if they feel like they are failing them. It is important for the people who love the ENFJ to show them as much support as possible. They need to feel appreciated for their hard work. They also need to feel acceptance so that they can let go of the guilt that they feel for not being able to be present during their depressive time. Wow. Now, how's that compare with what God did? Mm. I mean, 
Do you see any similarities? God put him in a, a group of prophets, gave him somebody to train. And you, you get the sense from these prophets, they revered Elijah. He was like a, a guru. You know, he was the sage. He was the man. It's incredible. What about these three cities? You know, now this is a little bit of speculation on, on, on my part, but God chose these three cities. Now it's right here at the end of Elijah, Elijah's life that he happens to be going from Gilgal to Bethel. God takes him to Jericho, then he takes him over the Jordan River. But maybe during those six years, this is where he hung out. And we don't know that. The Bible's silent, but could be. And what I want to do is <clears throat> take you to uh, each of these places and just talk for a moment about the significance of each of these places. Why would God choose to have the prophets hang out in these specific cities? Maybe the prophets chose that. Let me read you a little bit of the history with Gilgal. And, uh, tap into your, your memory of Israel's history. Gilgal was the first camp of the Israelites after they crossed the Jordan River from the wilderness. It served as their base of operations during the initial conquest of the Promised Land. Joshua set up a memorial there. After the Israelites had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, the next generation of men were circumcised at Gilgal prior to their upcoming battles to take the promised land. That's in Joshua 4 and 5. So Gilgal represented a significant milestone in Israel's history. Consider the following. When Abraham built his first altar, says in Deuteronomy 11.30, it was located not far from the Oaks of Morah, which is where Gilgal was. It was the first Passover in the Promised Land, Joshua 5. The angel sent to confront the Israelites for not obeying the Lord, that angel came from Gilgal, in Judges chapter 2. It was one of the three towns that Samuel set up court to judge Israel. 1 Samuel 7. He offered sacrifices there, Samuel did, when the ark was no longer in the tabernacle at Shiloh. He offered sacrifices at Gilgal. And when Saul was appointed king, the Israelites renewed their allegiance to King Saul there at Gilgal. You know, just being in that town would remind Elijah and Elisha of Israel's journey with the Lord and being freed from their slavery in Egypt. The previous circumcision would have reminded them of the relational covenant with the Lord and provided renewed resolve to remain committed as a prophet. Now let's, let's try to make that practical for us. What event in our life would be a reminder of our covenant with God and being rescued from our slavery? from the world. What moment in time is that for us? Baptism. Yeah, your baptism. Gilgal was that for them. Hmm. It would have reminded them, we have made a covenant with God. And that's something, you know, if God used that as part of Elijah's transformation, then maybe we Maybe that would be helpful for us. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to get out of this mm -hmm. funk to go back to your baptism. Because Elijah and Elisha, if they hung out in this area during those six years, Gilgal was a special place in Israel's history, and they would have been reminded of that frequently. 
Okay, Bethel. Let's talk about Bethel. The second one, let me read you a little history of Bethel. When Jacob fled his brother Esau, he was sent by Abraham to his uncle Laban to find a wife. And on his journey, he stopped to get some rest. As he slept, <coughs> Jacob dreamed of a stairway that reached from heaven up to, uh, from earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. You remember that? Genesis 28. The Lord spoke to him in a vision. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I've promised you. Jacob's response was inspiring. He set up a memorial pillar. He poured olive oil over it, and he called that place Bethel, the house of God. Later, God commanded Jacob to come back to Bethel and build an altar to him. Jacob obeyed, and God appeared to him a second time. God reaffirmed his promise to make Jacob into a great nation. But later in time, though, <clears throat> oh, this was when the second time, this is when God changed Jacob's name to Israel. And Jacob set up another memorial and anointed it with both wine and olive oil. Later, the Israelites would often go to Bethel to seek direction from the Lord because the Ark of the Covenant was there. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the grandson of Aaron, was the priest. Judges chapter 20. It was one of the three towns to which Samuel set up court to judge Israel. So that's a special town, right? Bethel. But after Samuel, about a hundred years later, King Jeroboam made sacrifices to idols at Bethel. So the city had become corrupt. They actually built an idol there at Bethel and they worshipped the idol. So by the time Elijah and Elijah visited there 50 years later, the town was still corrupt with Jeroboam's golden calf. <coughs> that golden calf was not demolished until Josiah did it 200 years later as described in 2 Kings 23. So even though the idols were still there, the people were corrupt. Elijah and Elijah would have been reminded of Bethel's origins and significance in Israel's history. Recalling how God spoke to Jacob, renamed him Israel, would have reinforced their identity as a nation. So Bethel, had, Bethel played a really significant role in Israel. And every time they went, and there's a group of prophets there, but there's this huge golden calf in the market square that people are still worshiping but these group of prophets have separated themselves and Elisha and Elijah was there ministering to them what would Bethel represent for us you know it was a reminder of God's promises with his interaction with Jacob Jacob built these altars, made commitments. God made commitments to Jacob. They would been they would get their identity as a holy nation. Do we have such an event like that for us? What gives you the identity that I'm God's people? We are part of something bigger than the idols I see around me. We are I am a part of something bigger than me. What, what gives you that reminder? The roots of who we are as God's people. I think of just the church. Yeah. The church? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say. And that's something that, and during this healing process with Elijah, God <coughs> used Prophets, spiritual men who were totally committed to surround Elijah. So if, if you're in, you know, that one of these emotional 
difficult places and you're trying to come out of it, you've got to surround yourself with spiritual people mm -hmm. who can give you the insight and the perspective that you need. Mm -hmm. You can't get it by yourself, sitting mm -hmm. alone, isolated, even in the middle of a town that's got this huge golden calf in it that's not going to be destroyed for another 200 years, Elijah could still be spiritual and focused mm -hmm. and have that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's wrap it up here um, with uh, Jericho. Obviously, that was their first battle that they came out with into the promised land. That city would represent... You know, God's power, God being able to do amazing things if you're faithful and trusting and obeying. Just being in Jericho and remembering the story, God is the same God. Wouldn't that help you if you were Elijah? Why he had the courage to go back and face Jezebel? Oh, yeah. And the last one. He took him across the Jordan River. And this is interesting because throughout the Bible, <clears throat> God used the Jordan River as a place of transition for leadership. Mm -hmm. um, when he transitioned leadership from Moses to Joshua, he divided the Jordan River in Joshua 4 to allow the Israelites to cross over. And the, so that the people would put their trust in Joshua's leadership, just as he had done for Moses at the Red Sea. He chose that moment. When the Lord was transitioning the New Testament preacher from John the Baptist to Jesus, where did it happen at? The Jordan River. So what an appropriate place to transition from Elijah to Elisha was right there at the Jordan River. You know, it's no wonder Elisha requested a double portion of his spirit. What an inspiring location and dramatic display of God's power for transitioning his lead prophet from Elijah to Elisha. You know, and for us, all of us can think back moments in time when God did amazing things through your life. And so even if you're <coughs> stuck emotionally, you can think back, mm -hmm. I remember. Mm -hmm. And God used that as part of, you know, this time of healing with Elijah, but also for Elisha. And, you, you know, we're not going to read all the stuff he did, but he did get a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing journey and healing that God did to Elijah. And I think some of the lessons here for us can help us as we try to help people pull out of depression and difficult situations that they feel so trapped in the way God did. Taking them back to their baptism, taking them, surrounding them with spiritual men and women who can help their perspective be able to remember God's power and things he did in their life, <clears throat> whatever support, personal conversations God had with Elijah, the environment he put him in, you can see how it not only filled his emotional cup, it gave him the confidence to go back and face his fears. Mm -hmm. It gave him the confidence to not freak out when he's being threatened to being killed again. He sat on the mountain, connected with God's angels, and made the right choice. It was an amazing story. I think final thoughts. Anybody want to, as you've heard how God healed Elijah, um, anybody want to chime in with your own thoughts or encouragement? Mm -hmm. This is just a great study, Lee. I really appreciate it because it just gives it this big broad picture of what happened in his life and how uh, a thoughtful God is mm -hmm. and, and down to the intricate details of how to help him and how over oh, such a long time you know a lot of times I want things fixed pretty, pretty quick sometimes <laughs> yeah, me too. And, and you're what, what, what do you, would you say is the 
length of time from the beginning to the end? Well, when Maybe we after uh, Jezebel. Well, when you look at this timeline, I mean, he when he's triggered from Jezebel and he starts running, you know, he there's about a 40 to 50 day period until he gets to Mount Sinai. And then how long it took him to get from Mount Sinai to Elisha when he anointed him? It might have been another month. So there's only a couple month period there. And then you see this six year okay. period before he's taken. Six years. So it's yeah. just about six yeah. years. Yeah. You know, in Ephesians 1, he talks about he, he, he lavish, lavishes us with grace. <clears throat> and, and right after it says, with all wisdom and understanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's done in such a way that it helps us uniquely. Yeah. With wisdom and understanding. Almost customized. To yeah, us. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm very grateful for the, for the message. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Other thoughts? We'll close it out here. Yeah, Last I'm, chance. Go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I was thinking the same thing as Tom was thinking just about how I think it's easy to forget when you're going through things that God is still working. You know, mm -hmm. you, you just, you know, like I can get really discouraged. Like, okay, I have. You know, I'm still insecure. Why am I still insecure? Why can't I? You know, but you just forget that God is working through all those little incidences and building your character. And, you know, just like he did with Elijah, I'm sure he didn't see it all at once. So mm -hmm. so that was really encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, I thank you for coming out. And uh, this has been a very encouraging study for me as well. This has helped me tremendously in my own life. Thank you for coming. Thanks, bro. All right. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you.